Throughout the last 30 years, numerous genres of video game have emerged and then evolved into something quite special. The 90s in particular was a hotbed for innovation. Its software revolutionised the first-person shooter genre with Wolfenstein 3D and then Doom, and Ultima Online and EverQuest served as huge blueprints for subsequent MMO RPGs. But perhaps one of the biggest splashes came in 1997, when a video game called Final Fantasy VII released on the PlayStation and opened up an entire generation to a genre that up until that point had been deemed quite niche and obscure, outside of Japan at least. Final Fantasy VII was not the first role-playing game to be produced in Japan, after all, it was the seventh iteration of that particular franchise, but its impact in comparison to those prior releases and games from other franchises like Dragon Quest, Fire Emblem and Fantasy Star was far more monumental and impactful. And that was because alongside making people more aware of the brilliance of Japanese role-playing games, the more long-term side effect was that a whole new generation of creators would be inspired to make similar types of experiences. Many of those creators would be based in Japan, but not all of them, and some early examples of creators outside of Japan exploring the genre were seen with Septera Core, which was developed by an Illinois-based company called Valkyrie Studios, and Anachronox, which was developed by Ion Studios, who were based in Dallas. In the years that have followed, the trend has continued, and more and more international studios have sought to create games that are associated with the JRPG genre, and 2021 will see the launch of a new initiative. It will combine the unique experiences provided by some of the creative minds who worked on games such as Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy Tactics and Final Fantasy XII with years and years of knowledge accrued by the talented individuals found within a Quebec-based developer called Artisan Studios, and this combination will allow an old project to rise from the ashes like a phoenix, born anew. Together, this melding of talent will hope to right the wrongs of the past and create a unique experience that will be unlike anything ever seen before within the genre. This is the history of Astria Ascending. There's something to be said about wanting to go back and fix past mistakes. And when Astria Ascending launches on the 30th of September 2021 on all major platforms, that notion will play a crucial part in the story of how and why the final product will turn out the way it has. But to understand the how and why, it's necessary to jump back a few years to the announcement of a brand new role-playing game called Zodiac Orkanon Odyssey. Zodiac was being developed by a small studio called Kobojo, who had its roots in France, but also had a satellite office in the United Kingdom, and it was designed to be the latest entry into the JRPG genre. Following its reveal at the 2014 Tokyo Game Show, journalists around the world were excited about the potential shown by Zodiac in its initial trailer, with IGN even singling it out as their best surprise of the show. This was based on the game featuring an intriguing graphical style, but also because of the involvement of numerous Final Fantasy alumni, the first of which was Kazushige Nojima. Nojima had acted as the scenario writer on Final Fantasy VII, VIII and X, as well as Kingdom Hearts and its sequel, and he was the main creative force behind the Fabulous Nova Crystallis mythology. He left Square Enix in 2003, not too long after the merger, and continued to work with prominent IPs relating to the company, but by being more independent, he was also able to explore a wider array of projects such as The Last Ranker and Glory of Hercules. It was revealed that Nojima would be the scenario writer of Zodiac, and his writing would be complemented by the musical talents of Hitoshi Sakamoto. Even though the pair had never worked on a project together during their time at Square and subsequently Square Enix, Sakamoto had still worked as a composer on a plethora of top-tier games within the franchise, including Final Fantasy Tactics and Final Fantasy XII. And as he was also independent, leading a music production company called Basiscape, he supplemented this by working on other popular games like Breath of Fire, Valkyria Chronicles and Odin Sphere. Zodiac's visuals would also be influenced by Final Fantasy, as it was revealed that they would be handled by Psy Designation, a subsidiary of Psy Games, who had Hideo Manaba as its president and Akihiko Yoshida as a company director. Both had been involved with a significant number of games, such as Final Fantasy VI, IX and XIV, as well as Bravely Default and Terror Battle, and they would be involved in a supervisory capacity, with wider members of the team at Psy Designation making sure their signature style was clear to see. When it was first announced, it was stated that Zodiac Orkanon Odyssey would be released on iOS devices as well as the PlayStation Vita. 
and the following year, the developer also revealed that they would be releasing on the PlayStation 4. But when the game launched, just over a year after that announcement at the 2014 Tokyo Game Show, the reception was mixed, and it only released on one platform, iOS. There was significant praise for how fantastic the game looked, as well as its innovative gameplay style and slick user interface. The criticism was levelled at how unfinished the game felt, with numerous bugs, a lack of content, poor sound design, and a narrative that felt incomplete. In spite of this though, Zodiac did still win Best Game on iPad Pro during Apple's Best of 2015 showcase, and it showed the potential that existed within the property. That potential, as well as the reception Zodiac received, lingered with some of the employees who worked at Kobojo, and one of those individuals was Mario Rizzo, who at the time was the CEO of Kobojo. He had been attempting to transition the company away from producing free-to-play mobile games in isolation, and had come up with the initial idea for creating Zodiac. It was meant to be part of a wider reaching strategy that would play into his team's strengths and interests, but its reception and performance upon launch was not strong enough to convince certain stakeholders that it was a viable strategy. Four months after Zodiac had been shipped, Mario Rizzo left Kobojo and founded Artisan Studios alongside veteran game designer Julien Bourgeois. They realised there was an opportunity to create more experiences like Zodiac and set up Artisan with the goal of developing games in partnership with Japanese developers and publishers. Not too long after the studio had been established, they decided to pitch an idea to Idea Factory and Compile Heart at a developer convention, and although it didn't progress as planned, Artisan were encouraged to instead pitch for another project that Idea Factory had in the wings, and they ended up being brought on board to develop Super Neptunia RPG. This represented the first time a non-Japanese developer had ever contributed to the Neptunia franchise, and it was an opportunity for the team to show how much they loved Japanese games and the Neptunia franchise in general by delivering a game the fanbase would enjoy. Upon release, that objective was met, as Super Neptunia RPG was well received by the franchise's dedicated fanbase, and as thoughts moved on to what the next project should be, members of the team who had worked at Kobojo couldn't help but think back to the release of Zodiac. According to Julien Bourgeois, the team felt that Zodiac had many great characters and monster designs that only a few people had the chance to see and play with in the way that had been intended. They felt the original had just not come out in the proper way due to many factors and they really wanted to give another chance to the artwork. Due to their connection with those characters and designs, it led to the team making a bold decision. They not only chose to reclaim the assets from Kobojo, but vowed to make better use of them. It meant they wouldn't just re-release Zodiac, fixing issues that existed within the original game. Instead, they would reuse those original assets, integrating them into a wholly original property. It would feature a new story, complete with original characters not seen before in Zodiac, new gameplay mechanics, and a new battle system. Even animations and visual effects would be created from scratch. The team also felt it would be appropriate to try and reconnect with as many of the former staff members as possible. So, even though Zodiac had been shipped many years before and their work had been completed, the decision was taken to try and re-establish contact with Nojima, Sakamoto, Minaba and the wider team at Side Designation. They wanted to give them the opportunity to work on this exciting new vision, and after each of them said yes and the core team was assembled, work commenced on what would become known as Astria Ascending. Nojima has always attempted to create balanced stories that bring joy to people, but also bring tears. To help build this new narrative, Nojima worked with the team to create and build upon the established world and then layered over the protagonists and antagonists. Each was developed from scratch or redeveloped from the original with a simple objective, to be unique and fantastical. But they also wanted everything to be grounded in reality so that players could relate to the plight of both the heroes and villains based on their own life experiences. This narrative approach has been evidenced numerous times before in the stories of classic games like Final Fantasy VIII and X, but also more recently in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. But outside of that wider objective, Nojima has also found it important for there to be a narrative theme, something that can help to focus the writing and inform how those moments of joy and sadness manifest. For Astria Ascending, it was decided that one of the main narrative themes would be perspective. At its core, the narrative revolves around a group of protagonists, denoted as the Chosen Ones or Demigods, who are on a mission to save the world. But as it's a recurring requirement, and new Chosen Ones are selected every three years, even though from a cultural perspective the protagonists should feel proud about being selected for this task, 
As they know they are fated to die once it has been completed, they aren't exactly thrilled about what's in store and just want to get through the next few years with minimal fuss. It's an interesting premise, and perspective is introduced through the use of a diverse cast of characters known as the Fated Eight that feature numerous demographics. Alassia and Arpajo, a summoner and thief respectively, are both in their 60s, while Dagmar, a big burly man, is a master sorcerer. The vigors of youth are provided by Caden and Echo, and Ulan, Alec and Cress are all in their mid-20s to late 30s. Alongside their relative life experience, which has allowed the writers to explore a lot of themes not often present within video games, each has had a specific character trait revealed, such as Arpajo, who as a thief is quite sly, and Ulan, who as a captain, is determined. And this, alongside many of them being from different races and backgrounds, will help to provide a lot of different viewpoints as the various narrative arcs play out. The notion of perspective will also be introduced through various NPCs that are interacted with as part of the narrative. Due to there being a time frame for when the protagonists will perish, the writing team wanted to use the story to help people empathise with their family and friends, as well as people in reality who are in a situation where they know their loved ones only have a certain amount of time to live due to a terminal illness. But beyond that, family conflict plays a big role in the story. In the wider sense, everything of course is not as it seems, and as the protagonists interact with those who are believed to be their foes, they will gain a new perspective on the world around them, as well as the true nature of the conflict that they have been forcefully involved with. Such is the power and importance of this wider theme of perspective that Nojima was even asked to write the lyrics for the game's main vocal theme so that it would permeate through almost every aspect. Alongside the new narrative, a whole new gameplay system was developed and it was heavily inspired by Final Fantasy XII International Zodiac Job System. Bourgeois resonated with the philosophical implications of that particular version of Final Fantasy XII which was overseen by Hiroyuki Ito. It saw players forced to choose a job class right at the start of the experience and commit as they would not be able to change it after the decision had been made and would need to learn how to use the job to its fullest in order to complete the game. To balance that rigidity, the development team has striven to make the experience feel flexible so as to not make players feel punished for their choices. They therefore decided to make it so that multiple characters can be assigned to the same job, and conversely, it should also be possible to finish the game without even using certain job classes. They also wanted to introduce a huge amount of customization, so alongside the base job, players can select a main job, support job, and even a sub job. And based on this, it's possible to play through the game using only the base job or by unlocking many, many other jobs and experimenting with how the various combinations affect each character's performance in combat. The hope is that through providing this level of flexibility and customization, players will be able to explore the playstyles that work well for them, and a crucial part of this will be how the jobs translate into actual combat application. Astria Ascending will use a turn-based battle system that will be enhanced by the various job classes available, as well as the focus point system. When building this particular system, there was an appreciation that, quite often, JRPGs have a bulbous cast of characters, and although this allows for a lot of variety when it comes to gameplay styles and representation, it would often lead to a decent chunk of the playable cast being overlooked when it came to actual gameplay due to their application not resonating with portions of the player base. For example, if you were faced with a monster that was weak against ice, but strong against everything else, and you only had one character that could exploit that weakness and deal damage, the others would just have to make do with using ineffective attacks at best, or guarding and passing their turn at worst. The focus point system was designed to counteract this by making each character have a useful utility, even if the present scenario does not favour their talents. And by doing so, the character that shines in that moment is made even more effective. Taking inspiration from Shin Megami Tensei 3, the developers also chose to link the focus point system with strengths and weaknesses, as by exploiting an enemy weakness, additional focus points can be gained, but they can also be lost if an enemy is resistant to whatever action was taken. When these systems are then layered with the powerful super attacks known as cosmic breaks, summoning mechanics, stealing and the ability to swap characters, it will make the system feel quite dynamic. And due to the sheer volume of abilities and support abilities available, players will have a lot of tools at their disposal and mechanics that can be utilised to enact a variety of different strategies to progress through the game in a manner that should feel satisfying to them. As they do so, one of the most important driving elements outside of the story will be the music. 
Hitoshi Sakamoto and other members of Base Escape have returned to work on Astria Ascending, and they have attempted to create a score that embodies the various narrative themes. The idea was for the music to contain subtle messages for players who are more musically inclined that will reveal certain details about how the story will evolve. The score has also been constructed so that when the end of the narrative is coming close, there will be a marked change in how the music manifests itself to the player. What's been quite challenging and interesting though, is that much of the work has happened throughout an incredibly difficult period. As staff members working on Astra Ascending are based all around the world, many of the creative minds working on the project have never actually had the chance to meet. Had development happened a few years ago, they would have had the opportunity to get together and discuss various approaches in person, but the team has persevered nonetheless as they believe in the project. And they are hopeful that when it launches, gamers around the world will enjoy its message and the contribution it will make to the JRPG genre as a whole. From the outside looking in, the wider objectives of the whole project feel quite noble. It's rare to see a developer reclaim assets from a previous project and look to set the record straight by producing an entirely new game as opposed to re-releasing and fixing the old one. When it launches on the 30th of September 2021 on PC via Steam, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, and Xbox One and Xbox Series X and S day one via Game Pass, Astria Ascending will also provide a unique opportunity for fans of JRPGs. The sources of inspiration are clear, but it's rare for fans of the venerable Final Fantasy franchise to see some of the brilliant creative minds we've had the pleasure of experiencing over the years combine their talents in such a manner, especially when it's combined with the passion, enthusiasm, knowledge and dedication of the team at Artisan Studios. And we hope you've enjoyed learning about the steps they've taken to bring this game to market. Be sure to let us know your thoughts about Astra Ascending in the comments below as well as whether you're picking the game up. And if you enjoyed the video and its wider concept, then please do hit the like button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so you get notified immediately when we publish new content. I'd also really like to thank Dear Villagers, the team at Artisan Studios and Kazushige Nojima for their help in producing this video. You guys rock! Alright everyone, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Raining Ekum, Benjamin Snow and Gregory, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.